I think we'll be okay. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, cut out the beginning anyway. Uh, okay, we've got a couple people walking in. Hope everybody has their water or something to drink. If you haven't gotten something to eat, there, I know there's lots of good food out there. Beth just brought a, a big chicken pot pie. Please don't make us take it home, so have some. <laughs> okay, um, you want to, whoa, not fall off the chair. And you want to open us in prayer? Okay, I'll get Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, thank you for this time and this opportunity to gather together to uh, study your word and to worship together. Lord, we just pray that you fill this space with your spirit, and that you are open our hearts, soften our, our hearts, and um, ready our minds to be able to receive your truths. Lord, there's some uh, pretty difficult stuff that's coming in study, but we pray that you would uh, help us to understand uh, your intention, your purpose, your plan, and that uh, your love and salvation and your overall purpose of, of uh, reconciling all of creation back to you would be made clear to everyone who is studying your message. We are getting to the punchline of uh, revelation uh, and creation, and as we near, uh, it, it, we just pray that you would uh, make it obvious and evident uh, what you want us to take away from this. Lord, we lift all this up in the name of your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Is your mic back on? Uh, I will barely hear you. Oh, maybe I should raise my voice. Well, I'm, I'm on. I, should... <laughs> okay. I, just, I, I could hear you talking next to me, but I didn't think it was transmitting out Mind there. Find the house? Yeah. I can hear you. No, it's in the house. It's I'll just raise my voice. Okay. Sounds good. All right. <laughs> Okay, um, well, welcome back, everybody. So excited to have you here today. Let's see if I can move that out a little bit so you stuck in the popping. Um, okay, well, here we are. We are about to start in Revelation chapters 8 and 9. Uh, are you grabbing the mouse, Chris, to advance the slides? No, I already have the mouse. I'm turning on my microphone. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. But while I'm here. <laughs> but while you're here. Okay, um, Okay. so here we go. This this is a slide. We've seen this one a couple of times now. Um, chapter 1 of Revelation. Uh, this is just a quick, quick reminder of everything that we've been through so far. Uh, chapter 1 was the things that John had seen. Uh, chapters 2 and th 3 were the things that are or the things that were happening in the churches that this letter was being sent to, this revelation from Jesus. And uh, this... It was the current state of the church. We learned all the things that we can take away as uh, church members, as Christians as well. And then chapter 4 began the third part of Revelation, which is the things that are to take place, the things that are to come. And chapter 6, which we started last week, began the vision um, of God's final judgment of sin on the world, his judgment on sin. Now, these are the scenes of final judgment. Uh, these are... Uh, as we said, the ookiest parts of the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to try to explain, delve in, get a little bit more in depth. Um, so if you remember, if you want to go to the next one, the, uh, I asked some questions last week, and we had a little bit of a discussion when we started this off. Um, you know, how do you feel about the depiction of God's judgment on the world? How can a loving God exercise the kind of wrath we're exploring? And what if the world's sin and injustice were never dealt with? So my question this week, based on what we've been going through, based on what we've been talking about, maybe if you've read ahead at all, has your opinion, has your answer to any of those questions changed? Nope. Okay. Well, good. You guys are all very, very uh, steadfast. <laughs> so that being said, as we dig into what's going on in Revelation 8 and 9, um, there's a, a way to think about this. Um, the previous chapters we talked about, that they were like birthing pains, that they were like the preview of what to come. The previous chapters are what we witnessed with the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse and the breaking of the seals. That was like the movie trailer. It was a preview of what's to come. And it is going to get progressively more and more intense. And we're going to dig into the what, 
more importantly, the why. All right. When we get to uh, what is it, Revelation nine, uh, where the, the fifth trumpet gets blown, um, that's the highlight. That's about as bad as it gets. Uh, uh, trumpets uh, five, six, and seven. And even in that moment, there is a larger truth that we are going to reiterate. We've talked about it before, and we'll come back to it. And that is God's overall plan and his priority, and it is the fulfillment of that great mystery of Christianity and God's salvation that people struggle with so much. But we just we need to highlight and re-highlight and reiterate that message because, exactly because, this is such a tough message and such a tough image of what's going on. And that, that question, that question that's up here that we've discussed in the past, you know, how can a loving God exercise this kind of wrath that we're exploring? That question, just by the way it's phrased, just by the way it's framed, reveals a lack of understanding of who God is and why he works. That even in his, even in his judgment, his judgment is derived from his holiness. His judgment is derived from his, love. from his love. And people don't get that. People don't get that, but the best illustration we have is actually in that the trumpet when we get to it. Okay, so I wanted to take a quick step back and talk about the rapture and the tribulation, because I know we've talked about these terms a couple of different times. Uh, and I wanted to let you know that there are three main interpretations of when the uh, rapture is going to happen. So the rapture is when the Christians will be taken up to leave the earth and, and be with the Lord. And um, the way the text is that they will be taken up in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And there are three different times of the wind that different people interpret it. Now, the, the first of those is the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, this is what I believe based on my study of the text. This is what we believe as a church, and what that means is that the Christians will be taken up from the earth prior to this time of tribulation that we started looking at last week. And then there's another view, um, and that's because in Revelation 4.1 it says come up, and that's sort of the prior to the tri tribulation happening, that is when you know the interpretation is that the church is going to leave the earth and we're going to come to be with the Lord. And then the second one is that the church will be on the earth for the first half of the tribulation, uh, about three and a half years, and then they will be raptured. And then the third one is the post-tribulation rapture, and that's when uh, the church on the earth will be present for the entire time of the tribulation, but they will be protected because they are sealed. Like I said, I'm just giving you this because I, I, you're going to get... Questions. People will say, well, I thought it was that there is a, you know, mid-tribulation rapture. They're on uh, the earth for about half of the time, and then they, uh, then they go up. Well, ultimately, if you want to go to the next slide, um, the, the which is correct is, is unclear. It's not explicitly spelled out in the Bible. Scripture doesn't state it's going to be exactly this. We are interpreting... Um, prophetic word written in the apocalyptic, but this is what we believe based on the study within the scripture. Did you want to say something? Yeah, and what I would add to that is the whole either or thing is a fallacy on, on its face because really it's both and. Um, and where because we, there will be Christians that become there are Christians, Christians you know, on the earth. What's the definition of the church? The universal church is the entire body of all believers. And as we've seen, God isn't done evangelizing and bringing people into saving faith. The, the whole purpose of the tribulation is to give every soul every opportunity to repent and turn to him. And so the whole, you know, what the, you know, does this church go into the rapture before or after the tribulation? It's like, well, there's yet the church that exists before the tribulation starts gets raptured, but then... As those he who become those the who church come, become the church and are continually on the earth. But the earth. Here's what I wanted to pull out as actually the important part of this, the important piece of this. It is that um, all Christians hold in common some truths. And those are that Christ will return. That is absolutely clear 
from the scripture. He will re return in a bodily form. He will be fully visible and known, and he will rule with his resurrected and transformed saints, those who are the believers forever. Now, God only knows all of the specifics. And I wanted to bring it up tonight because it's easy to get stuck in the details of it. And I want us to pull back from those details, especially as we start to get into some of this and hold on to the greater truth, which is that Christ will return and he will return triumphant. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to start with Revelation 8, verses 1 through 5. Get that? When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, remember we, we broke seals one through six in previous chapters, and we said the seventh seal isn't going to get broken um, until chapter eight. And what's significant about this is that um, there's three progressions of seven. There's seven seals, then there's seven trumpets, then there's seven bowls. And it's almost like you know one of those Russian nesting dolls, right? Every time you take the lid off, there's another one just like it, but nested inside, and then you take, take it out and put it back together, and then you take the lid off of that one, and there's another one inside. There's this progression where the, the seventh of the previous sequence initiates or kicks off the first of the next, okay? So a lamb breaks the seventh seal. When the lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar, and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth. The thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. So as, as Chris said, the verse one, it says, when the lamb broke the seventh seal, what this is doing is connecting the first two series of judgments and then this is followed by an immediate action of silence. I just wanted to give you a real quick taste of what silence sounds like. Because silence in heaven is striking. It's absolutely striking in this moment because there has been up to this point extraordinary activity and noise that's uh, happening in the, the heavenly scenes that we've been watching. And silence in scripture, what it's indicating is respect, submission, and anticipation. There is a grim reality of the judgments that are to come. And it bears a pause in this moment as the reality of it is about to be unleashed. And, and this is a holy pause. It is reverent, respectful, submissive, and it anticipates what's coming. See, so the seventh seal, in and of itself, it actually has no content of its own. Rather, it, it contains and serves to introduce the trumpet judgments, right? And the text says that the seven angels are given seven trumpets to announce the outpouring of God's anger against sin. So in and of itself, it does not have a judgment, but it is the preparatory for the seven trumpet judgments that are about to come. The other thing that's significant about the presentation of the seventh seal and the half an hour afterwards is the progression of time through Revelation. Time in the Bible is uh, an interesting concept. Sometimes it's linear, sometimes it's non-linear, sometimes it's literal, sometimes it's metaphorical. And if we remember back at the beginning of Revelation, it talked about how uh, these are the things that will come to pass quickly. Uh, some of these things progress for uh, periods of you know, months or years. We talked about things being three and a half years for you know, the previous steps and seals being broken in the, in the steps. Um, this one, the breaking of the seventh seal, reminds us that the progression that John is reporting to us is literal and linear. 
right? Things happen quickly one after another. And so this you know, silence in heaven for about half an hour, that is that reminder that there's a literal progression of time uh, in Revelation. It's not metaphorical. At least not in every case. There's <laughs> significance um, to the half hour. Why, why half an hour? Let, 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 I, I got stuck on that. <laughs> why not 45 minutes? Why not 20 minutes? And, and I hate to come to this answer. I don't know. I don't know. There's no specific half an hour. You know, half an hour relates to it means something else. Go ahead, George. Is that half hour on God's time? Or is it on your time? And, and, and it's like asking, you know, was it a literal day for the creation of the earth? Was it a literal, you know, seven days? Or was it God's timing of seven days? Christopher's point is really the important one. This is a linear progression of time. And if you were going to compare three and a half years to a half an hour, is that a literal three and a half years and a half an hour? Maybe. But it could also be this is a large period of time and then this is a brief pause. And I don't know if this helps because it's, it's just my impression, but um, what we're witnessing, what we're being um, shown a vision of, is really a type of ritual in, in heaven. And so the, the previous uh, portion of the tribulation of you know, the, the breaking of the seals and the uh, release of the four horsemen and you know, the, the advancement, you know, th there's a lot of logistics that need to be um, executed in order for those things to happen. Right? So God is into dispensations, right? There's, there's this section of time, then we advance to this section of time, and we advance to this section of time. That's a, that's a theme that we see over and over throughout uh, the scriptures. And so the progression through tribulation follows that same pattern of dispensations. And so the conclusion of the breaking of the seals of the scroll is like the one portion of the um, um, uh, ritual. And it takes a moment to prepare for the next phase of the ritual. And so what I literally envision is it takes a minute for the seven angels to line up and gather their horns and get into the right position so that they're in the right place for, to, to initiate and start the next portion of the ritual. Um, it just it reminds us that when we talk about uh, angels being living beings, we talk about um, the resurrected body of Christ, yeah, this isn't happening ethereally or just spiritually, metaphysically. These things are really happening. And it takes a minute to get from point A to point B and get everybody lined up with their... their who's been in marching band? It takes a minute to get the band lined up, right? So uh, I, I think that the half an hour is a rest, a moment of reverence, a moment of awe, a moment of silence, you know, in, in respect of what just happened, and also in preparation, just as I said, in preparation for the next thing that's to come. And it's, and it's also literally the logistics getting lined up to start the next phase of the ritual. Okay, so then I want to talk about the next piece of that scripture where it talks about the, the incense burner, or uh, some versions of the Bible will say the censer of prayer. And John sees at this point another angel, and that angel has a great amount of incense. And this incense is to offer up the prayers of God's holy people, of the saints. See, uh, going back to Old Testament science, uh, times, burnt incense had a very significant part or role in the worship of the Lord. It symbolized the rise of prayers of God's people. And remember we talked about the aroma filling God's nose, and it's a beautiful, it's a sweet and a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And what's interesting about this is this particular practice of burning of the incense and bringing those prayers up to the Lord, that happened twice a day during, uh, during the Old Testament times, leading up into this point. So uh, those who are reading this will be very, very familiar with it, and John certainly was as a Jewish believer. And this would have been something that they did during the morning sacrifices and during the evening sacrifices. Um, so this is that time where the angel is bringing forth all of these prayers of the saints. They, they, these are their cries, their, their prayers for justice. Um, remember we saw last week, you know, them sitting underneath the altar, and it was them crying out because they had been martyred during this time of tribulation, right? 
which what we have to remember about this is you know, how did we say God answers prayer? God answers every prayer. God answers every prayer. One of three ways. Yes. No. That's not part of my plan. You don't actually need that. You're going to come to realize that you don't want what you asked for. <laughs> or wait. Wait. God has literally been saving up the prayers for justice from his people for all of time until this moment. Mm -hmm. And the significance of what's about to happen next with the censer or, or the incense, or burner, the incense the burner in the bowl is that it is no longer going to be used in the same capacity. We're going to see something shocking and different. What is it? What is it? It's that that angel takes that censer, fills it full of fire, and casts it back on the earth. Did we already read that? Or mm -hmm. that okay, no, yes. Yeah. Okay, that censer, which was for the conveyance of God's people's prayers up to God, is no longer going to be used that way. Meaning, we're not storing anything up anymore. Now is the moment. This is it. And we have to remember in the midst of all of this and in the midst of our lives, it's really easy to want justice. We're actually designed to want justice. God, God instilled that inside of us. Um, but we have to remember that, as Christopher said, you know, yes, no, wait. This was a waiting period for God to dispense justice and judgment. Uh, if you look at Romans 12, 19, it says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. And if you can imagine it, when the angel throws down this incense burner full of fire, there is thunder, there is lightning, and there is what is most likely, because remember we talked about these being progressive in nature, an even greater intensity earthquake that hits the world. Something I wanted to take a quick moment and, and talk about it because as we read through this, you're going to hear this phrase a lot. And it's not because John is a valley girl and he just likes to say the word like, because that's what I picture. It's like, you know, it's like. Well, it's because John doesn't have the words to describe all of the things that he's seen. I would take that further. Humanity doesn't have the capacity to understand everything that is being revealed at this point. Yep. So he uses the word like. It's like this. It, it resembles this. It looks a lot like. It, it feels like. And here's the important part of this, is that we don't necessarily need to take this literally. It, it doesn't mean that the things that we're about to see appear in exactly this way, but the word pictures that John is creating evoke a feeling. And this is the feeling of what he is seeing. Now, will it literally look like that? Maybe. It, that's also the entire point of an apocalyptic work. We talked about that word in the beginning. An, an apocalyptic was a writing style that used incredible imagery as a form of metaphor and as a form of illustration to convey ideas, to mm -hmm. convey feelings, to convey concepts. Now, is it literal or isn't it? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are in the Bible that uh, didn't make sense based on our understanding in science. These are some of George's favorite YouTube videos that he sends me, and they're wonderful. Um, that, you know, there's, there's things that seem like an impossibility based on our understanding of physics. Whoops, then as we understand more and more about physics, we come to find out that the way God described it in his word, it's actually entirely possible and likely that that's exactly how it happened. So, is this an apocalyptic? Is this a metaphor? Do we have to use the word like because we're describing something that we can't wrap our heads around? Yes. Is it going to look exactly like that? Wouldn't surprise me if that's exactly what, what is unleashed in God. And part of the reason for that, part of the reason, is we need to talk about angelology for just a second. <laughs> we, we've got to talk about angels. Okay? People don't really understand the power that is wielded by angels whether it's one of the high orders of angels or low orders of angels, okay? So there's an illustration. Passover. Okay, if we look at what happened in the Passover, and we look at what the logistics of that would have looked like, okay? God says in his word 
okay, that this is one of the plagues of Egypt that was used to convince Pharaoh to let my people go, right? So what happens? God unleashes an angel that is under his control to go into the land of Egypt. And in that one night, this individual enters into every house and makes a judgment call. First of all, is this a house of the Jews? Okay, is this a house that has been marked as God's people, which means that they have the blood of a lamb marked across their doorpost? Okay, and if so, he passes over that house, hence the old term Passover. If that is not a marked house, now what does that mean? Were there, were there Jewish households where people died that night? Absolutely. If there were unfaithful Jews who didn't do what God told them to do, that marks them to that angel as an unfaithful individual, which means they're not God's people. So then that angel goes into that household, does a quick genetic study of every person in the household, identifies who the firstborn son is in that household, and then takes them out. Takes them out silently, takes them out without anybody knowing, and, and snuffs their life. But then that wasn't enough. Then takes a little detour into the stables of every one of those households, and does a quick genetic study of every single animal in that, in that stable, and takes out the firstborn of every one of those lineages. If you looked at the military capacity of every military might in the world, they would not be able to pull this off on a nation in one night. To invade, enter into every household, and silently, without anybody being able to, to notice, execute the, 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 the murder of the firstborn individual, whether they be human or not, in every single household. One angel did that. One angel did that. We are talking about some incredible abilities. We're talking about some incredible power. Okay? Another illustration, as we see in the Old Testament, one, in, one angel, when fighting on behalf of God or on behalf of his people, he wipes out, what is it, 240,000 individuals in one blow. They all die. Okay? The might of a being created by God is hard to wrap our heads around. And then here's the harder part. We're about to be introduced to a whole bunch of beings, angels, that God created that turned away from him. These are the fallen angels. These angels also have power and might and abilities that it's hard for us to wrap our heads around. So when we get into these scriptures, and it talks about you know, the ability to inflict suffering like a scorpion sting. We talk about their ability to torment. We talk about their invulnerability. We're like, yeah, yeah, right. But remember, we're talking about creatures that have been created by God. They have amazing power. And yet there's a silver lining. Throughout Revelation, throughout the entire Bible, we see that every one of God's creations still falls under his authority. He never <coughs> loses control of them. Even when they have been unleashed to do terrible things that he is going to use for his glory and our good, they are never outside or beyond his control. Not even the greatest of all of his creations, the greatest of his angels that he ever created, was actually Satan, Lucifer. He was the highest order of angels, the most trusted and the most imbued with power, and yet even Satan falls under the authority of God. George? The immediate scripture comes to mind, though. Do you not know that you will judge the angels? I have no idea what that is. The context of it. That's almost scary also. Uh, it's Jude. Jude 6. <laughs> Jude is, by the way, the uh, book, shortest book, in the, the book, second shortest book in the Bible. It's the one right before Revelation. It has no chapters. <laughs> it's, it's one chapter. And it's Jude uh, 6 and 7. You're in second John. That's because Jude is such a small book. That That's because Jude is such a small book. <laughs> Third John and Jude got stuck together. <laughs> and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority of God gave them, but, uh, what did I say? 
within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. He's going to judge those angels. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. So it reminds us, you know, they, they, they went outside of God's authority and he locked them up, chained them up. For what? For his coming judgment. What's his coming ju judgment? Sodom and Gomorrah. Is that what you're talking about, George? Probably. Maybe. And then, then you're actually going to hear about that again here in just a minute as we go through the rest of eight and nine. But let's go. Let's uh, turn now to Revelation eight six and seven. Just two verses. Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blasts. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire. One third of the trees were burned, and all of the green grass was burned. So this is the first trumpet. Um, you see that in this picture, the seven angels are getting ready, they're prepared, they're ready to blow their trumpets. Each one of them is going to indicate another judgment, and each with increasing intensity. These judgments take place after the seal judgments, and probably during the second half of the tribulation. And the events associated with the trump trumpets strongly parallel. Remember we, saw, we said we had you know, glimpses throughout the Bible of what this looks like. A lot of this in the trumpet judgments will strongly parallel the, those of the Exodus. Those of the time of Moses, and albeit this is going to be on a much, much wider, vastly wider scale. So the first trumpet is the earthly destruction. And it most likely describes uh, more volcanic eruptions that are going to result as a, as a, to be a result of the earthquake that just happened when the angel threw down the pan um, with the fire and the lightning and the thunder and the, there was a mighty, mighty earthquake. Now there's going to be volcanic eruptions that happen. Um, and from this, remember Christopher was saying that um, you know, John uses like a lot. He's describing this as best he can. Well, science actually gives us some explanation here of really what this can look like, which I think is really amazing over the course of history um, that we're starting to see what each of these things could be. And we have sort of a name and a, and a, a scientific explanation behind them. In this case, it's, it's probably that steam and water are thrown into the sky because of such eruptions. And though that steam could condense into hail and fall to the earth, uh, along with the fiery lava, so mixed with blood. Uh, dust and gases, uh, they may contaminate the, the following wa fall falling water so that it also appears red. Um, the, yeah, and then the lava storm will create a, a blazing fire that devastates one third of the earth's forests. So this was judgment on the earth. This is earthly destruction. Now we're going to go to the next one, Revelation 8, 8 and 9. And the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood, one third of all things living in the sea died, and one third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. So here's the second trumpet. The second trumpet is one of aquatic destruction, affecting the earth's oceans and the seas. And uh, so where the scripture says that there's a great mountain of fire, it probably refers to an asteroid or a, a, a meteor of really great size that has been hurled into the sea by God. Uh, and I know we've, we've probably all either seen a movie or heard a movie or about a movie or we've read a book and, and you know, this is sort of that, that concept of what happens if an asteroid hits the earth, right? Well, destruction, chaos, and in this case, if it hits the sea, this is destruction of the aquatic life. So this could uh, create a tidal wave, and that tidal wave destroys one-third of the Earth's ships that are out to sea. And, and I point that out because that would have felt significant for the, the people of that time, because what, what was the mightiest power it was the naval army, the, the navy, the, the, Roman navy the Roman navy, right? So destruction of ships in the world, one third of them wiped out and gone, 
this is a this is a, a seafaring understanding culture. Like we think about ships, and what do I think about? I think about a cruise ship. I think about a barge that's carrying my stuff from one place to another. And, and what they would have thought about is the the ships of people, the the ships of the the Roman Navy, um, and it would have been this mighty power in their mind that God then wipes out. To add to that, the, in the same culture, in the same time frame, for most of history, most of history, land was a barrier to passage, and waterways were actually a causeway, a, a, a mode of, of transportation. It was much safer to, to travel by water on a floating you know, house than it was to go overland. Mm -hmm. you know, roads and um, you know, overland travel is really a modern invention. For, for most of time, um, really, land was a barrier, and the thing that, that changed that the, mo the most was, you know, the Roman infrastructure of roads, such as it was, and yet the transportation of people, and especially of goods, because of the weight that it took to transport them, was always on water. It was always easier to float your supplies than it was to carry them by cart. The infrastructure energy uh, that it took to move things over land on cart and by ox cart and horse-drawn cart was much more than by floating it, whether it was upstream or down, downstream on a river. So the other thing this would have represented would, would be a crippling of all of the mechanisms of distribution for all supplies throughout the entire world. This is like, this is the end of the world as we know it, this is the end of civilization as we know it, and this, that, that's what this represents as well. Yeah. Um, so the next thing that it says is that the waters turn to blood, right? Um, again, that sounds very much like uh, when Moses strikes the Nile and it turns the, the waters of the Nile into blood. Uh, and this could have a couple of different explanations. The first one, um, as one-third of all of the sea life, because it says one-third of the sea life and the ships are, are destroyed, including all of the people, this could create an event that's called red tides. And red tides are... Um, Billi billions of dead microorganisms, yes. um, and it creates this red tide of toxicity. Of, of toxicity. Um, the second explanation is that it could literally be that there's a lot of blood mixed in the water as well. Um, but I think it's it's really amazing. What's that? If you take that, that there's a few. If you take out, I mean, imagine there, and and if you think about it, um, there is more aquatic life than there is life on land. Now take that and, and deplete that by one-third, and, and they are destroyed, and, and it could create um, just massive pollution and toxicity of the world's oceans and seas. Um, and then, as Christopher said, uh, this not only created a supply issue, that would have been you know, sort of their thought, um, but actually a major food source would have been depleted as well. The ocean because the ocean held food. Um, aquatic life was food at that time, and that, that now would have vanished as well. Okay, let's move on to verses 10 and 11. It says, uh, Then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one-third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness, or other versions will say wormwood. It made one-third of the water bitter, and many people died from drinking the bitter water. Okay, so this is the third trumpet. We've had one that's on the Earth's land, one that's on the Earth's oceans and seas. Now this one is on the fresh water supply on the Earth. Um, and it says it's, it's from a star called worm, Wormwood. Now it's, it's possible because of the way that it's described that this star is really a comet, because of the way it says it's fire and it has a tail, um, and that uh, it's said to leave that fiery trail behind it. So something that could happen, an explanation here, is that it could disintegrate as it's coming into the atmosphere, break in, into many, many pieces, and it scatters that effect, that, that poisoning of the fresh water supply. It's gonna affect rivers, streams, springs, pools, reservoirs, any source of drinking water, and making them unsafe to drink. Now remember, we were talking about the oil and the wine and those kinds of luxuries, those things that would make it so that you could uh, drink polluted water. Uh, they would have used it 
you know, to, to uh, make it safe for themselves. Well, they've already seen that that thing that they count as everyday staples, they're just not going to have that anymore. That would become an, an immense luxury. They won't have any way to unpollute the drinking water. Um, wormwood, it's a very bitter, it's a poisonous substance. It's derived from a root and it causes drunkenness and even death. So if you've ever heard of absinthe, that's what absinthe was made out of. It was made out of wormwood. It would uh, foul the taste and the purity of the world's water supply and many more fatalities would follow because people would have no fresh drinking water. Okay. You know what it took for people to be able to drink absinthe? <laughs> they had to pour it over a sugar cube in order to be able to even drink it. It was that bitter. I've never tried it, and I don't blame it. <laughs> yep. It was a thing. Over a sugar cube. Yeah. It was a whole thing. Okay. Uh, Revelation 8, 12 through 13. Want you to read that? You got it. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one third of the sun was struck, and one third of the moon. And one third of the stars, they became dark. And one third of the day was dark. And also one third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air. Terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. Some translations say, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. whoa. Yeah. So this is now the fourth trumpet, and with this fourth trumpet that's blown, John saw cataclysmic damage happening, taking place among the heavenly bodies. So we've had the surface of the earth, we have had the oceans and the seas, we've had all of the fresh water supply, now everything in the heavens that they can see is now affected. The, the, the natural result of such an occurrence uh, would be unprecedented darkness, day and night. And you know, we were in um, Alaska, and they were talking about how in the winter time there's like a half an hour daylight. of semi-daylight. And, and they wouldn't even call it daylight. Um, and, uh, yeah, of twilight, you know, um, where the sun is, is still setting. You can see, but it's it's saying now think about this um, and they, they were talking about how that was that would affect them um, they it, it was easy to become depressed in that time it was easy to feel um, withdrawn and and that's because they didn't have sunlight and uh, imagine that at this point there is no Sun ever on the entire world on the entire world. There would be a loss of solar heat. So, you know, why is it that it's warmer in the summer, cooler in the winter, right? It's our distance to the sun. Um, and then imagine that there is just no sun. And the heat that you have from the sun, there would be no more warm summers. This would be unbelievably cold. And this loss of heat would severely affect not only the weather, but the plants and the biological cycles of the world. So the believers in the seven churches who would have received this vision may have thought at this moment in time about the ancient Egyptians. Remember I said that this, all of these trumpet judgments really parallel what happened in, in Exodus. Um, they would have greatly suffered God's command uh, when he blocked out the sun. There was a terrifying darkness, it says, while the sons of Israel had light. Uh, and so this could have brought to mind for them that parallel in the scripture from earlier. The other significance is that God really is impacting all of the rest of the universe. Mm -hmm. He's undoing creation. The impact of sin was not just on humankind or just on living creatures. The impact of sin is on all of creation. It's decay. <coughs> it's um, rottenness. Eventually it's going to all rot out. There's actually a concept in thermodynamics about this. It's called entropy. Everything is decaying into randomness, eventually leading to the dissolution and destruction of the entire universe. God is, in, in, as is shown here, 
he's pouring out his wrath on the earth, but he's also pouring it out on the sin that has pervaded all of creation, mm -hmm. including the sun, the star. It's not just for humanity's benefit. I mean, there's a huge significant impact on humanity on earth as well, but he is judging all of crea fallen creation at this point. I saw a question. So, are there people on earth experiencing, has the rapture already happened? Are we gone? We're gone. Okay, but... <laughs> However, are there, are there people on the earth? Absolutely. We're about to see them. We're about to see them. We're about to see the people. And we're about to see what happens to the people. You know, up until this point, we've talked about what happens to their surroundings. But there are absolutely people who are on the earth. And, and when we get there, I'm going to point out something that's vitally important. Because what we feel is, oh my goodness, the people on the earth and the devastation that they are experiencing. And I'm going to point something out later. It looked like you were really bothered by that answer. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Should be. It's you, you, you should be. It is terrible. Um, okay. So you want to go to the next one? So then he talks about the soaring eagle that's coming around and says, terror, 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 or whoa, whoa, whoa. And this uh, depends on which version of, of the, the text you're looking at. And the soaring eagle announces this triple terror or this triple woe upon the earth in anticipation of the last three trumpet blasts. So if the first four of them were horrible, what's coming next? This is where it gets bad. This is where it, it, it's already bad. This is where it gets horrifying. This is where it gets ooky. This, this, is, this is where it gets extra triple ooky, okay? And where it really goes beyond human comprehension. Yes. This is where all the likes come in. Yeah. Because John doesn't have the words or the uh, understanding to be able to convey this in a way that makes sense. Yeah, we've sort of explained all yeah, the, the scientific yeah, perspective yeah. of what this meant. We but. talk about rain and blood, and we talk about fire from the sky, we talk about mountains from the sky, and all that stuff's pretty clear. Now we're getting into stuff where he's just, he's going, yeah, I don't have words. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in this particular instance, the eagle may symbolize an angel where an angel is said to be flying sort of in that mid-heaven area, uh, the comparison coming perhaps from flight and from eagles hunting their prey. Uh, but the vision is of an eagle. Is it an actual eagle? Maybe. That'd be one really incredible eagle, but God's God, so who knows? The eagle was also a symbol of regency, which is mm -hmm. a, a, an allusion to God's sovereignty, and king, kingship, ownership, rulership over all of creation. Okay, now we're getting into chapter 9. Um, so there's two pages of uh, verses here. You want to read 1 through 12? Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to the earth from the sky. He was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. When he opened it, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace, and the sunlight in the air turned, and the sunlight in the air turned dark from the smoke. Then locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or plants or trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So there are people. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain like the pain from the scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads. Their faces looked like human faces. They had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron. Their wings roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions, and for five months they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, the destroyer. The first terror is past, but look, two more terrors are coming. Okay, so we're starting into the triple terror, or the triple woe. And it starts with this 
a star falls from heaven. And then, I'll, I'll tell you, the first uh, times I read over this, I, I thought we're talking about a star, a, a celestial being, a heavenly being. And then if you look closely, the text says the word he. So this is a person. This is a personal being at this time. This is probably a reference to an angel, a fallen angel, or to Satan himself. Um, and so the Bible isn't clear about what this is, but there are a couple of different references. One is Job 38.7, and that refers to an angel being cast out of God's presence. Um, and then Isaiah 14 describes Satan as the fallen star. Right? So it could be either way of those. But whoever it is, this person will be allowed to release the inhabitants of the abyss. I remember Chris was just talking about when those angels fell and they, were, they turned from God, right? They became demons, in essence, and they were locked up. Okay, this is the abyss. This is where they are, also called sometimes the bottomless pit. And we have to remember, just as Chris said, that even if this is Satan, even if this is you know, the most powerful of all of the demons, God is in charge. And what's really interesting, go back and read the text, it says that this fallen star is given the key to the abyss, to the bottomless pit. That means God is in charge of the key. And they're not allowed to let out all of these uh, demons from the pit, from the abyss, until that is unlocked and unleashed on the earth. So if you want to go to the next one, we're going to talk about what the abyss actually is. So the abyss is mentioned in Revelation seven times. We see that number a lot. Um, and it refers to that prison where some of the demonic hordes are held. And it is a place of severest torment and isolation. And out of the pit comes smoke and locusts, or what look like locusts. And what this is, is that uh, the fallen star is allowed to release them. So the thing with the locusts, um, that could be a couple of different things, and it's probably all of them. Um, locusts, speaking to uh, people who were uh, living in the Middle East. Do you want to advance to the next slide? About the locusts, so they can see. There you go. Uh, this would have been a literal terror that they lived with uh, throughout their lifetimes. Uh, there, you know, these were insects that were sort of like grasshoppers, but there would be seasons or years where there would be a swarm. And when the swarm descended on a particular <coughs> area or a nation, it devoured everything. So, talking about them being like locusts, it um, invoked a couple of meanings. One is that it was this numberless horde, mm -hmm. just too many to be able to count, so many that they're not even like individuals. And then when they descend, when they land, and when they start doing what they're going to do, they wipe out all resources. And there is absolutely no recovery other than just trying to survive and get through. So does that mean these demons are itty bitty and little and kind of like insects? Maybe, maybe not, probably not. It's probably more that it is a metaphor to their, or an allusion to their incredible number mm -hmm. and the, the fact that they're everywhere and that you can't escape them. And one of the, the marks of a locust horde is you go into your house and shut all the doors and windows and they're like coming into cracks and coming up through the toilet. And, yeah, <laughs> you, can't, you can't keep them out. Remember, these, these, are, these are supernatural beings, right? And unlike insects that maybe you could not lock out, these individuals, yeah, they don't play by the same rules of physical nature. You can't lock them out of your house. Even if you could seal your house, they're going to pass right through the walls and come in to do what they're going to continue to do. So they're inescapable. You just can't get past them. Um, what, I, what I really want us to once again pull out from this is God still has control and God defines these limitations for this swarm, these locust-like demons that are let out of the, the pit. First one is they cannot harm grass, plants, or trees like locusts would. 
Um, they must honor the divine seal that God has placed on his people so they can't attack, torment those who are sealed as God's chosen. The implication being 144,000 special forces evangelists yep. that God uh, called are on earth at this time living through this and still talking about the good news, mm -hmm. the gospel. They're also, these, these beings are not empowered to kill. They are only power, empowered to torment, which is even worse. Uh, and they have a limited time frame. There's actually something um, that, that I, I, I wanted to point out here. It says for five, four, for five months, they'll be able to do this. Um, and this will be where non-believers are subject to torturous bites, which is a figurative description of the physical and psychological torment that would be worse than death. Um, and this limited time frame of five months is the normal life cycle of locusts, which usually would have been from about May to September. So that five month time frame um, plays into that description of the locusts. And, and something that I, I wanted to point out at this, this time is that it says that people will seek death and they will not be able to find it. Um, and the implication here is they may even attempt suicide, and suicide will elude them. They, they cannot die in this time. They will be tortured by these, by these demonic forces. Why? What? That's a really easy release. Because they're bad. bad. The people? The people. Yeah. Is that what you mean? The ones it would be too easy. The thing on there. Actually, that is a really interesting and significant concept. And it's going to be a brief promise. Um, <laughs> for we'll set my time. A, a, a tangent. One of the wisdoms of men throughout most of human history is that bad things happen to bad people. Karma. Okay? It's wrong absolutely wrong. When a rock falls and crushes somebody, somebody gets hit by a bus, someone gets sick with COVID and dies, someone catches Ebola and bleeds out, there's going to be people who their first thought is, I wonder what they did to have that coming. Job is full of it. Job's full of it. All of his friends thought that it was his fault. What's the logical fallacy in that? Just a matter of timing. The one thing that every living human being, with the exception of three that I can think of, have in common is death. We are all going to die. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. We are living in a fallen creation. We are fallen creatures. Our sin, the matter of which we are made, is corrupted by sin. And we are going to die. The silver, the silver lining, the good news, is that that is not a final death if we choose life with Christ. But this existence, this life, is going to end. Whether you get hit by a bus, bleed out from a bowler, or die comfortably of old age in your sleep, you're still going to die. So these people aren't more sinful or less sinful or more bad or less bad than everybody else. They're just not saved. They're more stubborn. Which leads to why. Why would God allow all these demons to come out of the pit like swarming plagues of locusts, empowered to torture, specifically to torture, specifically to torment, but not kill? And not only are they not allowed to kill, but the living people on the planet can't die at this point. They're basically immortal, no matter what they can what they can get. So they are sentenced to suffer horribly for five months. Sean. Well, uh, my thought is, is that it's essentially, uh, if it is true that the, the, the choice that you talked about of salvation, the common thought is that the dividing line to that choice is your physical death. Sense it's a, a mercy they can't die because 
because they still have that they, choice. They, 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 still they have, I mean, they made a supernatural torment, and so almost uh, supernatural mercy to go with it. That um, the, the mind of the non believer is, you know, the mind of why a lot of people commit suicide is because they're escaping pain. Mm -hmm. um, these people don't know that they're just escaping this pain, literally jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. That's right. Mm -hmm. So they're being prevented. Supernaturally prevented from making that choice, so that the, the, the horrible as it is, it's not eternal judgment. It's a, it's an, so it's a mercy in the sense they can. So Sean and Denise said, it. I'll come back to you in a second. Sean and Denise said, it. these are the ones who are the most stubborn. Okay, this is one of God's final strategies so to reach anyone who will possibly be reached. 144,000 evangelists are evangelizing. The evangelizing angel, is, we haven't gotten to him yet, he's in a couple of chapters, but he's actually active at this point as well. The, the prophets, the two prophets, their messages are happening at this time. God is literally giving the survivors, the holdouts, the stubborn ones, a preview of what hell would be like. Unending torment from which there is no escape. At the same time that they're hearing the message, the only way out, only way to eternal life is the good news. This is an act of evangelism on behalf of, of God. That's the purpose of this. As awful as it sounds, this is an act of God's love to reach the last ones who could possibly be reached. What were we going to say? I was just going to ask if Jesus paid for our sins. And is this the payment? For the people who didn't have Jesus pay for their sins. So let me see if I, I'm understanding. Is this is this a result of them not choosing Jesus? Yes, in that if this is happening to the non-believer. Is this their final judgment? That's the rest of eternity. No. And that's the mercy. And that's the mercy. Is If this is a glimpse, of just a glimpse, of what hell will be like for those that don't choose Jesus, it is a mercy that they are being given the opportunity to still repent. The one thing that we, we forget to look for in Revelation is God's loving opportunity to turn to him over and over and over and over and he is going to use every method that is possible to reach as many people as possible yeah lawyer while this is all going on and we've been caught up with all this stuff where's the people that's already dying that's an interesting question. I guess we'll back to slides just so we can take a picture of it. I'll be right back. Oh, okay. So keep going. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she can't do it from the mouse. Heck yeah, we can't do it from there. We, we have uh, some technical issues. So where are the people who have not chosen Jesus? Where are they at right now? That have already died. Okay, so we talked a little bit about this. Uh, was it last week? last time. Yeah, we, we know um, the answer to this because of uh, the uh, parable of Lazarus. It's a parable, and that's the story the, of Lazarus. The, and not Lazarus who raised from the dead, another Lazarus. And Lazarus is in, and there's this chasm between him and those who are uh, who are not who have not chosen God, who are over on the other side. Um, and Lazarus has. And there's a, there's this tale in the Bible, and the people of God are being cared for. They are being loved and yet on the other side they can see that there are people who have not a drop of water and who just would you just bring a drop of water and place it on my tongue for my relief there is no relief so they're sitting in a place where they're either being cared for as god's children or not this is pretty brief so 
The parable of the rich man, I'm reading this fast. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus said, there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There, in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. Besides, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over from you to you from here, and no one can cross over from us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them, and your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. Ooh, such a truth there with Jesus. Uh, but Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded uh, even if someone rises from the dead. So where are those people who have rejected God and his message and his clear uh, evidence throughout their lives and their opportunity? They are on the wrong side of Abraham's bosom, which is sort of like hell, but not quite as bad as it's going to be. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So they don't get a second chance. That is unclear. Doesn't look like a period according to the scriptures. That is, it, it is unclear, but here's the thing. The scripture just said, Jesus is telling them they could read the, the, the Bible, they could read about the prophets, they, they, they know what Moses has said, and they choose instead to not choose God. So, have they made their choice? Maybe. That's the way it appears in Scripture. Their heart is hardened against God. And we're actually going to see that spelled out in just a few verses. So this part, um, I just wanted to give you this uh, as a little bit of background. Um, first off, the ruler of the swarm, the horde, the locusts that John describes is either Abaddon, which is the Hebrew version, uh, which means destruction, or Greek is Apollyon, which means the destroyer. Basically, both of those are, the, the swarms are being led to destruction and to destroy, uh, even though they have slightly different meanings. And God is going to use this destruction against a very rebellious humanity, against the most stubborn of the stubborn. We have to keep in mind that these are the people who are adamantly opposed to God's will. And yet, they are still being given the mercy to choose Jesus. The vision of the locusts carries some connotations, some meanings as well. Faces of men probably means rational beings, intelligent, alliance teeth, fierce, powerful, deadly, and the breastplates of iron that are designed to protect vital organs. This indicates that these beings are invulnerable. They cannot be taken out. They cannot be killed. Okay. Let's jump into verses 13 through 21. This is going to take us through the end of Revelation 9. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. Then the four angels who have been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one-third of all the people on earth. I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. And in my vision, I saw the horses and the riders sitting on them. The riders wore armor that was fiery red and dark blue and yellow. The horses had heads like lions, and fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. One-third of all the people on earth were killed by these three plagues by the fire and smoke and burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses. Their power was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent. 
And that's the part that I need you to hear. These are the people who still refuse, in the midst of what is obviously acts of God, these are the people who still refuse to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They continue to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders or their witchcraft or their sexual immorality or their thefts. These are non-repentant people, given every opportunity, at every turn, to say yes to God, and they still don't. We need to talk for a second about idols. Do you have a question? Slide. No? Oh. <laughs> He's not there yet. We need to talk for a second about idols. What, is, what does an idol mean? What do you picture when we talk about an idol? Anything that goes before God, money. Okay, you're landing where I wanted to land. <laughs> you wanted all these other answers but, first. But, but you know, <laughs> people talked about how they shaped silver idols in the yeah. shape of, uh, of uh, uh, oh, that was a golden calf, yeah. Sil silver Athena, the silver Athena and the silversmiths. And the people would shape little gods made by their own hands in order to When you say uh, idols, I think of the one in Indiana Jones. The, yeah, the little gold idol that you have to uh, yeah. switch on. Yeah, okay. So the idols, right? But you are exactly right. You, you've got it. It's anything that goes before God. Anything that goes Anything before God. that we place before God. So what was listed here? What was listed? They continued to worship demons and idols made of Gold, okay, silver, uh-huh, bronze, uh, that's weird, stone, and wood, and metal, and paper, and gunpowder. tell you a quick story. A um, number of years ago, uh, I was a gun nut. I was pretty well obsessed. I uh, spent a lot of time, it was an issue in my marriage because I spent so much time and attention focused on, you know, how to build the best AR-15. Um, just researched it all the time, just just loved it. And um, then started coming to church, got saved, got serious about studying, and um, there was this little thought in the back of my head. Now I know that's the Holy Spirit working on you working on your heart, convicting you of, of areas of, that are an issue. But there was this little voice in the back of my head that was going, this is an issue for you. And I didn't say anything for like six months. When I confided in Heather, I said, you know, I, I'm not ready to do anything about it yet. But this thing where I'm obsessed with firearms, um, I think it's a spiritual issue. And I, and I need to process that. And I just need to say it out loud, confess your sins. Say it out loud to someone else that um, I think this is something I need to work on. The Lord kept working on me. As soon as I said something about it, it became a lot easier to do something about it. But I realized that I was idolizing firearms. And not them specifically. I wasn't getting down and bowing in front of the stock of the holy 1911 or whatever. I wasn't praying to, you know, uh, Stoney, the, the inventor of the AR-15. It wasn't anything weird like that. It was just that the, 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 the power, the independence, the significance, the wealth, the independence that those things represented to me were being held here. And I would not let God get above it. And so they were an issue of idolatry. So I did one of the weirdest things I have ever done. I prayed over each firearm in my collection. And the ones that I realized, I was obsessed with that. That represented something significant to me. I loved that. Oh, there you go. I'm loving something that isn't God. I liquidated them. I liquidated them. I sold them off. 
That was one of the most significant spiritual processes I've ever had in my life. So when I see this list, you know, they continue to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, wood, iron, metal, paper, money, gunpowder. We're talking about civilization. People build up their fortresses, you know, this is going to keep my safe. End of the world, zombies march like a horde, and I'm going to be safe in my tower. That's idolatry. That's you putting your trust in something other than the Lord. This is a really powerful message, and it goes much beyond what we give it credit for. What are the things that we idolize? It talks about how uh, they, they would not repent of their murders or their witchcraft or their sexual immorality or, or, their, or their thefts. Remember who we were talking to in the seven churches at the beginning of this book. One of them was Ephesus. Ephesus has other things that are told to us throughout other parts of the Bible. We see them in Acts, we see them in the book of Ephesians. And one of the things that happens significantly in that city is that people who are practicing witchcraft have this mass conversion. They have this mass conversion. And what do they do? They take all their books of witchcraft and arcane knowledge and they bring them into the center and they pile them up and they burn them. They don't even sell them. It's not like we're trying to get the value back out of them. They're like, no, this is wrong. I've been idolizing this. I burn this. They found the things in their lives that were inconsistent with conforming to God's will, and they burned them. If this happened in our society today, what would wind up on that pile? Retirement accounts? Books? Vehicles? Firearms? Magazines, DVDs, drugs, drugs, television, internet connections, modems. Clothes, makeup. What are all those things that we cling to for comfort or dependence that we put ahead of God? That's what these the people who did not die in these plagues still refuse to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. It sounds like this thing that we can't even understand. But it's happening in society all around us right now. That makes my blood run cold. No. 21 minutes later. Um, uh, no. Uh, one of the things that I really want to pull from that, though, this is something that Christopher is very passionate about, and they should be passionate about. And what was an idol for him may not be an idol for you. But all of us have idols. Every single one of us. Because every single one of us is a sinful, imperfect person. Which means we will always have something that takes first place with us that isn't God. So you have to do the individual work to figure out what that is. And that may come in the form of that, you know, nudging in the back of your head. Oh, this really probably isn't a good thing. And then you have to follow through with it. And that could be even things like a sharp tongue. Because you hold your sharpness, your wit, your power, sense of, humor. sense of humor, whatever it is, you hold it above God's will in your life. So idols are not an easy thing to, some of them are easy, but they're often not the, the worst ones. There's an idol of pride. That one's a really hard one to figure out where you put your, who you are, your identity, above who God desires for you to be. So keep in mind, truly, through all of this, and I said I was going to come back around to it, and I did, it feels unimaginable that a merciful God would allow such torment to happen on the earth. But it is a merciful torment, and it is with the design to bring as many more people to him as possible. And 
it is against those who are 100% not repentant about their sin. Yeah, Denise. So in, in trying to, because I have, you know, my boys are not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And Alex's big question, and I posed this to Christopher, is how is this possibly a choice? Either I go to hell or I go to God. Yep. How is that a choice? Because it's a choice. Well, he says it's not. Who wants to go to hell? That's what he's. That's what his point is. That's Nobody right. Wants, nobody wants to go to hell. Nobody but wants not, to. It's not a choice. Either you know, either I rot in hell or I go see God. Nobody. This is his phrasing. Nobody is stupid enough to want to live in hell. So you're not really giving me a choice. You're saying. Except you that to lots God. of people are stupid enough to not choose God. Right. I just. That's I know. Just, I, that's a really, argument. really hard one, and it's it's an intellectual debate of an emotional <laughs> uh, decision? Um, part of the reason we talked about this and we talked about your son is because you know, I, went, I went through uh, a very, very similar process of uh, in intellectual dissonance um, where it's, it's, it's almost like it's a false dichotomy. And one of the ways um, one of the ways I uh, figured out how to navigate this. Stop me if stop me if I've brought this up before. We've heard this. Um, one of the ways that I navigated this was actually through an episode of um, uh, Rod Serling's um, Twilight. Twilight. It's weird, but God will use. <laughs> God will use whatever He can. Um, and these are now in the public domain and they're actually accessible. I can send a link out to this episode. It's only yes, what, 22 minutes. Um, but there's, there's this fantastic episode where um, there's a criminal who dies in the act of commission of a crime. And uh, everybody gets up and walks away uh, uh, from the commission of the crime. Then he stands up. Of course, he's dead. It's a spirit who stands up. And he meets a guy who looks weirdly like Pastor Tony. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> And uh, this is his uh, guide in the next life. And uh, it says, you, you've reached eternity. You've reached the other side. This is what would you like to do? And he takes him, he sets him up in a hotel, and it's a casino, and he gets the penthouse, and he gets the drinks, and he gets the food, and he gets the girls, and he goes downstairs, and every time he throws the dice, it's perfect. Every time he draws a card, it's 21. Every time he pulls the slot, he hits a uh, 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 jackpot. And uh, he's having a blast. He just he loves this. This is absolutely fantastic. So his guide says, uh, well, if you've got everything that you need, uh, I'll leave you here, and I'll check in with you in a little while and see if there's anything you need. So he comes back. It's, it's supposed to be like a month later or something like that. And uh, he says, how you doing? The guy goes, well, I'm all, I'm all right, I guess. He says, what, are you, are, you, are you not doing okay downstairs? He goes, no, I win every time. And he goes, how's the food? He goes, it's always delicious. He says, and, and get the company. How's the company? He goes, they're too easy. He says, well, what do you want to? He says, can, can we go rob a bank? He says, sure, we can arrange that. Goes, hmm. Okay, wait a minute. You say we arrange that, but is there a chance we can be caught? He says, if you'd like, you can be caught. No, no, no. You don't. You don't get it. It just doesn't have that. <sighs> makes me want to live. You know what? I don't think this is the right place for me. I, I think maybe you ought to take me to the other place. Maybe I belong there. And then his guide laughs at him and goes, "This is the other place." <laughs> we started the episode. You know, welcome to eternity. This, this is eternity. And. I really thought about this you know, brilliance of Rod Serling. I'm convinced he was an absolute saved Christian. We talk about eternal torment. We talk about pits of fire. Right? And um, are those metaphors, they may be, are they literal, they may be. If they're metaphorical, um, the explanation, I think, um, may be incredibly terrifying. One, um, you're going to be alone. Right, in, in this little illustration of, of Rod Serling's 
no one in that world is real. They're all animatrons, they're all puppets. No one there is actually a real living being. This guy is alone in this world, surrounded by theater. The theater. Okay. Second of all, the only things that he can have access to are the things of his own imagination. Okay. There's a lot of things I love to do in this world. I love to go quadding. But you know what? After about four hours of quadding, I'm kind of done. That truth extends to everything that we can think of and be creative. If you were stuck in all of eternity by yourself and only with what you could come up with, sooner or later, remember eternity is a long time, you're going to run out of things. You are going to be bored. And the only thought that you're going to have to resonate in your empty mind for the rest of eternity what you're missing. You're missing an infinite God of relationship, of meaning. And you will know forever that it was your choice that you didn't want. You wanted what you want rather than what he wants for you. So that, breaking it down like that, makes it so it's no longer this false dichotomy. It's simply God going, you can either have what you want, or you can have what I want. Have it your way. And if we pick what we want, we're going to run out of what we want. If we pick the God of infinity, infinite creation, infinite love, infinite possibility, infinite power, infinite time, that's what we get to have forever. It will be infinitely satisfying. Infinitely satisfying infinite thing being. So, I've been waiting for him to call me so that we can have this conversation, but he has to want to have the conversation. So I, I had some meaningful intellectual conversations that we can walk through. It's the same ones that brought me to a meaningful resolution of these apologetic problems. And God will use the weirdest things. To me, it was through Rod Serling and that stupid movie Pulp Fiction that God used these things to reach me. I hate to admit that I love that movie Pulp Fiction because it's gross. And yet, that which the enemy would use for evil, God will use for good if you let him. If you let him. And so God reaches us through whatever it takes to, to reach us. And so... <laughs> oh, is that a, John? The lights are bright. I just, I was reminded of something I heard a pastor say. It was one of those mega church pastors. Who, uh, take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> it's got, it's got some, I'm sure it has some truth to it. That, uh, when you talked about um, people being quote unquote stupid and like, choose against God and choose to turn into away from God. Um, um, what the point he was making, the, the guy that I heard, is that when people who choose hell, it really is a choice. It's not a naive choice, but people who are, who are so against God, they'd rather be there than with God. Um, and, that, and what he was saying was, if, if after a thousand years of hell or whatever, if God would go and open the door to hell and say, okay, all you want to come be with you, you can come out now, they would slam the door back in his face because they are so committed against God that they, they would still they not would choose him. to be there and away from mm -hmm. him. It may or may not be true, but but I, I'm sure that, that there's no, a, I, I I resonate a with, with like, that. Kind of like Pharaoh in Egypt, mm -hmm. knowing knowing fully a full knowledge of who and what God is, and yeah, it, choosing to be it was rebellious. absolutely evident. The the miracles in in Egypt were evident, and Pharaoh knew it, and yeah, his hard, heart hard. was hardened yeah. against the Lord. And and what you just said. Um, as your illustration, I, I think it's straight out of Revelation that we just read. You know, mm -hmm. God gives five months of right. preview of hell on earth, and there's people who still go, no. And, and I see that on man of the, on the street interviews that you can watch from, from church productions. People go up and go up and, and ask individuals, you know, what, what, you know, do you believe in God? Why not? And they say things like, I, I can't believe uh, a good God would allow that. Or, um, you know, there's people who, 
who, it's not that they believe uh, that God exists, they don't believe that God is good, uh, that, they're, uh, that they're limited understanding, and the understanding that they have is that he isn't good. And, and therefore they would never choose him. And so in the face of this torment, what they're refusing is to accept anything other than their own decision, their own intellect, their own understanding. And so they're saying, nope, this is what I know, and this is what I'm sticking with, and I will not be dissuaded from it, I'm sticking to my convictions. And that, that, that's the basis by which they reject God, even in the face. So, yeah. I feel like and and that is so difficult for people, especially in Western culture. To admit that they're wrong. To well, and even more than that, um, everything in Western culture tells us it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves. You know, we, the only person you can rely on is you, and. And the more you achieve, the better you are. Um, that's very Western in its culture. And it perpetuates the belief that they don't have a moment where they say, oh. Never give up. Never surrender. Never say die. George, you want to say that? Uh, I kind of, I don't know, but I, I don't want to say I set my foot in, but maybe I did. I went over to a guy and offered to pray for him. I don't remember now what his problem was. The older gentleman in a truck. And he, and he said, I said, is it all right if I pray for you? And he said, no, you don't need to pray for me. I know that I've already done so many things already wrong. And God's not there for me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know quite how to answer that. I pray for him more times than I have anybody else <laughs> Good. that I have tried to witness to. Yeah. And, and people really do believe they are unworthy of salvation. And, and you can come back to um, yeah, what is so the right many answer? people. What is the right answer to the person the who says, I'm so bad that God would never accept me. I'm already rejected by God. What is the right answer to someone who says that? Well, really, 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 the right thing to say is whatever reaches that individual. <laughs> um, but you know, th there's some paths you can take down. There's some things that spring to mind. What were you going to say, Sean? I was going to say the answer is you got to be careful with it, but um, if the man is right, then you have a sense of his unworthiness to God. And so, yes, you are right. You've done a lot of that, and you are unworthy of God. But the price is, and so am I. Mm -hmm. And the price you pay for that very unworthiness you sense. The man having the sense of his unworthiness puts him closer to actual self, true saving faith than most yeah. other people are. And you're right. You do need to be careful how you say it. You're right. You are unworthy. And, you know, God so God does reject you. I would say, so am I. <laughs> and so am I. Um, so I, I, I would use uh, God's illustration himself. What I, would, what I would say to, to that individual is that, you know, there, there's some other folks that, um, you know, followed that same pattern, that same pattern. And, you know, you know who they were? They, they were God's chosen people. The Jews, the Hebrews. These and were, these were David people. David was an adulterer, a murderer. He was a schemer. Yeah. God's chosen people rejected him over over and over, he stepped away and walked away and ad adulterized um, and, and idolatrized, which is adultery. Uh, you know, God's chosen people. And you know, what did he do? He pursued them. What did he do? He orchestrated the salvation of all mankind through those people. What did he do? You know, you're, you're right. You're not worthy. And God wants you anyway. Mm -hmm. And you are only ever one step away from being with him for eternity. And that step is turn and repent. One step. And no matter how many times you walk away from him, you're old, you know how many steps you take away, that's what we said at the beginning of the study. 
That what this illustrates is no matter how many steps, how hard and fast people run away, no matter how long they dig in their heels and are stubborn and refuse to turn to Him, they're only ever one turn, one step away from eternal saving grace. That, that's the gospel message. That's what we're called to share with people. So, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you say to someone in that moment? The gospel, in whatever mechanism reaches that person. There's a lot of ways to deliver the gospel. There's a lot of ways. Uh, the, some of the most effective are right here. Okay, so now that we're 20 minutes away from the end of this time period, we're going to get through the rest of um, the rest of this and talk through. It's only four slides. I know it's only four slides. Um, okay, so let's talk about the sixth trumpet. Um, this, is, this judgment describes the worst destruction yet in, God's, in John's vision. A voice rises from the four horns of the altar, and this was you know, the altar, the, 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 an area of mercy, actually, for the people in the Old Testament. They would, be, we, they would have been able to, if they were fleeing judgment, they could have come and grabbed one of the horns of the altar and asked for mercy. And so it's interesting that the, uh, the voice that is not identified, there's no specific identification for the voice, rises from the four horns, the mercy of the Lord. And this would have called to mind, we talked about, you know, the former pleas of the martyred saints, the burning of the incense, the prayers of God's people. And stored up mm -hmm. for all the time. And stored up for all the time. And, and at this point now, God is responding to the prayers of his people. And the voice from the altar is calling for vengeance. The voice commands the release of four more angels that will cause more destruction. Now, these four angels will likely be demons that were cast from God's presence and specifically set aside to incite the actions that followed here. But I thought it said they were angels. How could they be demons if they were angels? Because they could still be fallen angels. And because um, they were referred to as bound. Yes. Because God. they were referred to as bound, um, God does not bind his holy faithful, angels. Faithful. But he does bind those who have fallen, who have turned from him. Um, some interesting uh, metaphor and uh, in wording here. The Euphrates River was one of four rivers that flowed through the Garden of Eden back in the time of perfection. So it's possible that these fallen angels were bound from the fall of man at this, to, to this exact moment when God was going to release them. Uh, it's, it's actually important, again, to note that God is still in control here, and uh, he is resolving all sin and in, the present, and, and in the process of reuniting believers to him for eternity. Um, there is there's a, a line in here that says they were uh, saved for this hour and day and month and year. And what this needs to remind us of is that there is precise timing and God already knows. Remember we said God is not linear. He already knows the beginning from the end for all eternity. Um, but there is precise timing. This, this month, year, day, and hour that these angels will be released. It's already, it, it's already been determined by the Lord. He already knows all of the events of all eternity. Okay, and then he talks about the great army. The great army. John describes a great army, which has been, um, it, it's actually a scene of a lot of debate. There are two interpretations here. The first is that it's a literal army of humans that will wage war on the world. And the second interpretation is that it's an army of demons bent on destruction. So it's not completely clear what this army is. It's made up of horses and riot riders, and they look like lions, and you know, and they, their tails have snake heads, and they can bite and torture and all of that. And, and uh, here's what is clear, however. This will be a force that makes war on the earth, and it will kill one-third of the population. The description of heads like lions, tails like snakes, it represents their destructive power in both directions, front and back. Uh, the brimstone that comes out of their mouths, they describe it in this. It's yellowish, 
sulfuric rock, and it would have been common to the Dead Sea region, and when it's ignited, it melts and produces burning streams and suffocating gas. So this would have been a, a vision that they would have understood from this particular region. And then the last of these, um, before we get into some closing, is some still would not repent. And that breaks my heart in a way I cannot possibly describe. This chapter concludes with yet another indictment of humankind's hard-heartedness. Rather than being moved to repentance by what is ultimately just, just absolutely ghastly events that have taken place, uh, the inhabitants of the earth are going to persist in multi multifaceted idolatry. They will not repent. They will not choose God. Now, it doesn't mean that all of them, but the ones who are being, um, the war is being waged against, those who are being tormented, they still did not repent. The Bible makes it clear that sinners can become so hardened and insensitive that even the worst events will not soften their hearts. And I put this in here, Romans 2.5, it says, But because you are stubborn, and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And I gotta say, modern followers today, we need to gain an appreciation for the ingrained rebelliousness that exists in the human race. It is part of who we are. And we need to gain an appreciation for God's righteousness in addressing it. He would not be a righteous God if he did not address sin, if he did not address rebelliousness. And it's important that we as modern day believers that we understand that. Okay, here are the next steps. <laughs> In the, in the midst of studying these intense judgments. We can comfort ourselves by remembering that God has everything completely under his control. No judgment appears before its exact, predetermined, precise timing. It never lasts one instant longer than God wills it so, so that his purposes can be fulfilled. And if God can handle the whole universe with such precision, why do we doubt what he can do in our lives? Mm -hmm. So here is your homework of sorts. Over the next week, think about the areas of your life where you are not trusting God's perfect will or perfect timing. If there is an area God has graciously shown you, where he's shown you a hardened heart, Pray for God to give you the help you need to choose a soft heart and the life that it brings. And then if you would like, you can read chapters 10 and 11. And then I wanted to remind everybody one more time that we are skipping next week, so we will not come together next week, October 12th. We will return the week after on October 19th. Uh, and we will start chapters 10 and 11 on October 19th. Uh, so why don't we pray? But you can come to a movie on Saturday night. But you can come to see Jesus Revolution on the 14th. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we open your word and we look through this and we try to, to figure out what Revelation is saying, Lord, what you have given as the vision. I pray, God, that this week you would help search our hearts, search our minds for those areas where we are not trusting you, for those areas where we are pushing our timing and not your own, and help soften our hearts to wait for your exact, precise moment. Lord, as opportunities present themselves, as, uh, as we move through our week, help us to pause because not all opportunities are ones you want us to follow. And so this week, let's, 
I pray that you would help remind our hearts to wait for your moment, your precise timing, and to trust that no matter what it is, that you have it in hand. Lord, I pray tonight for those who have not chosen you yet. I pray that you would reach them. I pray, God, that you would use us. I pray, Lord, that each time that we come together and we study your word, we're better equipped, we're better armed, we're better ready to answer the questions of the world in a way that can reach them, Lord. Strengthen the story inside of us so that we can share our story with those that we come in contact with. We never want to see anybody come to the destructive end that Revelation is outlining here. Help us, Lord, to create an area of softness in ourselves and to help those around us whose hearts are hard to find softness, peace, joy, and comfort in your arms. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.